So um, I'm so excited to invite Nick and Ira to talk today. Um, we were looking when the GSCC board was looking, first of all, I'm Heather McLaughlin Garbage. I'm now the past president. David Horiuchi, who is helping me out with this today is the current president. Um, and we started these, you know, just to, to give people information. One of our first online sessions was also about COVID, but it was all of us being completely um, kind of shell-shocked and what do we do about it uh, way back almost a year ago. Um, it was more of a gathering of what are we, what are we gonna do? Um, now we're coming around to having a little more knowledge on it. The vaccine is, has been created. And so we uh, reached out to Nick and Ira um, as singers as well. We wanted to find physicians who are also singers and understood it from that point of view. Um, and so we're so excited to um, invite them to come today. I'll just give you a little bio about each one. Um, uh, Nick received his BA in Romance Languages and MSW in Group Work from Columbia. As a social worker, he worked in the Lower East Side of New York City and on Long Island. Um, after a sojourn in Italy on a Fulbright grant, he returned to his first love of medicine and while taking the necessary pre-med courses at Columbia, he worked as a high school guidance counselor. He received his MD from Georgetown in 1971 and completed medical residency at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. He and his wife Ellen came to Seattle in 1976 where he joined the faculty of UW Medicine and US Public Health Service Hospital, now Pacific Medical Center. Yay, there we go, I gotta click on that. Um, <laughs> Um, as director of primary care. Later, he completed a fellowship in allergy, asthma, and immunology, and an MPH at the University of Washington. As a member of the US Army Medical Corps, he saw active duty in Operation Desert Storm and retired as a colonel. He is committed to the integration of behavioral health with primary care and remains active as a volunteer on many boards, including Opus 7 Choral Ensemble. Um, as a singer, he has sung with Seattle Chamber Singers, Camerata, Seattle Symphony Chorale, and since 1985 with St. James Cathedral Choir, and is currently the choral librarian. Um, so that's Nick. He will present first, and then Ira will come along. Ira completed his pathology residency in 1991. Um, in a, in a completely side personal note with my father-in-law, so this is a small thing, in Pennsylvania. So there's a, there's a whole connection here that went on. Um, and moved to Washington to join Eastside Pathology that later became Insight Diagnostics. He practiced pathology at Valley Medical Center in Renton, Washington, where he was also the medical director of the clinical laboratory from 1993 to 2014 until retiring at the, at the end of 2016. Ira has been singing barbershop harmony since 1983 and is currently a member of the Northwest Sound Course in Bellevue. He has sung with Evergreen District Champion Quartets 4.0 in 2015 and Flashpoint in, in 2011, or 2001, pardon me, both of which competed for several years in Barbershop Harmony Society's international competition. And he currently sings with the Mixed Quartet Impact. Currently, Ira enjoys being a volunteer classroom assistant and guest speaker at high school science classes in the Bellevue and Renton area. He is also a volunteer assistant track and field coach at Newport High School in Bellevue and completes, competes regionally and nationally as a master's track and field athlete. He lives in Bellevue with his wife, Elizabeth, and they have a son and daughter who live and work in Seattle. And like I said, in a, in a very weird, twisted way, someone suggested Ira and I was like, wait, Ira, I know Ira really well. So, so it was a great connection between the two. So I'm gonna start with Nick and then we'll go to Ira. So Nick, take it away. So Wendy, if you could show your virtual screen again, that would be that would be very lovely at some point. Um, oh, oh, I, sorry. there a you reminder, go. Yeah. A, a reminder to turn off your cameras if you can, just to help us a little bit with bandwidth. Thank I just you. want to have a look at the at the universe there, because I'm gonna start with the universe at the Big Bang, believe it or not. Um, it's so nice to see some faces that I recognize from all the experiences that I've had singing in town here for the past 30 or 40 years or whatever. Um, so I was asked to do a presentation uh, explaining COVID and vaccines back in the fall for a non-medical group. And so I tried to put together some information that I thought would make it easier to access the, the understanding, the scientific basis for COVID and for the immunological basis for what the vaccines are doing. So I, I've done this presentation as a PowerPoint, which is narrated and it's recorded. And I, I put into the chat room, the reference and the YouTube reference for both recordings, the one about COVID and the one for smallpox, which is really a very good one that one, people might want to look at, which really 
gives a basic understanding of what vaccination is all about and how it came about. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to David, who's going to show the YouTube video uh, because I can't seem to show it from my computer. And it lasts about 27 minutes. And then at the end, uh, we'll turn it back to uh, Heather and she'll turn it over to Ira or whatever. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks for having me, by the way. David, all yours. You'll need to share audio. Hi there, this is Nick Minotti, and the first part of our conversation this afternoon is going to be a brief review of the immunology uh, of COVID and some talk about vaccines. And um, when we think about uh, immunology, we have to think about the difference between self and non-self. And if we start at the very basic level, we're going to start with the astronomical or planetary a notion of that and think about the protection of Earth from non-Earth then the protection of humans, then the defenses within the self, and then we get into the immune responses, and then we'll talk about uh, COVID options. We're not going to talk about smallpox, <clears throat> although that is a separate YouTube that uh, would be interesting uh, for, for you to observe with a good history of smallpox and the history of vaccination. Let's start with the um, astronomical level. When we think about um, human life, we need to think about what makes life habitable on, on the planet Earth. And the habitability of a planet de depends on the size of the star, the size of the planet, and the distance between uh, the, the, uh, the planet and its star. And um, that zone is called the Goldilocks zone and is the uh, zone in which current research is, is being focused as, as we look at other stars to see if there are any habitable planets that we can go and uh, migrate to at some point. Life on Earth was made possible uh, when there was protection from the harmful radiation and flares coming from the sun, the solar wind, cosmic radiation. Uh, and we are protected by a magnetic field called the magnetosphere, the Van Allen belts, which is a zone of energetically charged particles originating from this solar wind. These deflect the particles streaming from our sun, which would otherwise destroy all life on Earth, as it did on Mars. Mars no longer has a magnetic field, and therefore, there's no further life on Mars. The interaction of these particles with the, uh, the uh, magnetosphere at the polar uh, opposites of the Earth uh, emit uh, photons, which create the visible auroras, the aurora borealis and the aurora australis. But we need to think about uh, other apps, uh, uh, facets of Earth as we think about that. Um, and we need to think about what makes Earth habitable. And for that, we need to look at uh, relative humidity and temperature. And this defines where those zones are found on Earth. And of course, those are the zones, especially in Africa, where, elf, where, where Earth, um, where human, <laughs> human existence uh, first developed. Now, if we go forward a for a few billion years, uh, we now have an Earth that's uh, kept warm by its insulating atmosphere, protected by its magnetic field from radiation, and has the right chemical ingredients for life, including water, oxygen, and carbon. So moving on, hello, so we're going to move on here. There we go. Um, so now we have um, humans on Earth gathering into tribes and communities. But now we need protection, not only from the environmental forces, but also from other animal species, other humans, and from evil spirits. So we chose to live in places that had natural protection, such as the cliffs in Mesa Verde, or the top of the stone uh, pillar here, but also protected with our own barricades. 
uh, and Palisades here, um, but also um, moving into areas where we can build protections, like hill towns in South Italy, which is where my people come from, walls around the city, the Hadrian's Wall, the Great Wall of China, castles with moats and islands, etc. But we also needed uh, protection from evil spirits. So we had the amulets and onks and masks that would, would uh, scare away the evil spirits. And then we had household deities in the Roman times, the Lares and Penates, which would protect us from, from those uh, evil spirits. And, and also to protect ourselves, we had primitive weapons, all kinds of things made out of bone um, or uh, clubs, wooden things. Now here's a bola, which is a kind of a, a sinew thing with two rocks in it, which is thrown at animals to engage their legs and cripple them so that the hunter can then get close and slaughter them for food. And I thought it was interesting that the shape of the bola is very similar to the shape of one of our modern weapons of protection, which are IgG antibodies. And here's an example of IgG antibodies, very similar in shape to the bola. And of course we had fire, and this is actually a picture of a coronavirus with the antibodies going after it. And then back in um, the uh, medieval days, we had protection of the castle with fire pots, uh, hot oil. Here's a bowl uh, of pasta that's being presented by some invading Italians. And, and all they want is the oil. And the defenders are saying the dang Italians, they tricked us again. But more commonly, uh, they used a battering ram to attack the castle walls. Um, and um, once that hole was, uh, wall was breached, then they could enter and, uh, and rape and pillage and do what they, what, they, uh, what they do. But in order to understand um, who the enemy is, we need to distinguish them from ourselves. Um, so we have uh, armies with different flags and uniforms. Here's Achilles and Hector. Hector. And in more modern times, uh, we have uh, military uniforms. Here are the Iraqi military and Desert Storm. And then we have personal protection um, that would protect against uh, uh, outside influences. So the mop gear, which is the mission-oriented protective posture used in Desert Storm. And then civilian life, we have hard hats, we have vests, we have uh, straps and, and, uh, and cables keeping you from falling over earplugs, steel-toed boots, and then we have special uniforms for astronauts, the Ebola hazmat, and now this is the one that we've been using for uh, COVID. So tribes had to be able to readily, readily identify humans from other tribes as friends or potential enemies. So we looked for differences in language, appearance, and clothing, even smell, weapons, and flags, and we had the protection of the countermeasures uh, to uh, those attacks with the hot oil, the fiery coals, etc. In similar manner, uh, humans develop the protective gear that we now see in, in our use in, in civilian life. So at the individual human organism level, there are three levels of defense that have evolved. The first line are nonspecific barriers like walls and moats, which are the skin and the mucous membranes of the body. The second line are nonspecific patrols that uh, patrol internally and these are the leukocytes, white blood cells, and phagocytic white blood cells that chew up and eat everything. And the third line is the two immune uh, system, which we're going to talk about in a moment. So with the lymph nodes, the white blood cells, the spleen, which chews up things, the stomach and intestines that have their specialized cells, the skin, the respiratory system with the cilia that uh, move particles out of the uh, airway, and the mucus that uh, catches it, etc. These are all uh, lines of defense that have been de de evolved in the human organism to protect us against things that are dangerous to us. So again, three lines of defense, nonspecific physical and, and chemical defenses, innate immunity, which are the macrophages, neutrophils, et cetera, the complement system. This is what we're born with. And then we have the adaptive immunity, which is the acquired immunity, which has two main pathways cellular or cytotoxic, and humoral or antibodies. Now, the threats to self uh, can be many. It can be infectious organisms, it can be cancer cells, it can be transplanted tissues, toxins, 
parasitic infections, uh, organisms that invade and reproduce in the human body as part of their life cycle. Uh, these are all non-self. How do we know what is self and non-self? Well, for that, we have these little flags or little tags uh, called uh, MHC labels, major histocompatibility labels, that are attached to all cells except blood cells of the human body. And they mark the cell as self. And so when a phagocyte or an antibody sees these, it says, no, these guys are okay, they're part of us. But if the an, an offending uh, particle does not have that self marker on it, then it is viewed as an enemy. Um, and therefore it triggers a, re a reaction um, by certain cells in the immune system. So these MHC cells are found on all nucleated human cells and they help identify foreign antigens. So here's an, a natural killer cell which sees a healthy cell and says, ah, you're okay. I will let you go. But here's a natural killer cell that sees an infected cell that does not have that MHC molecule because it's being uh, infected by a virus. And the, um, the natural killer says, uh-uh, you're no good, and I'm going to lice you and eat you up. So let's look at those two pathways real quickly. So the first is the reaction with T cells, which looks at an infected cell that has an antigen fragment within it, which is presented on the MHC molecule recognized by the T cell receptor on the cytotoxic T cell as foreign, and then triggers a reaction to create uh, other uh, toxic uh, T cells that destroy, the, that destroy the infected cell, and also memory cells that remember it for the next time round. If the uh, antigen or the microbe or the foreign agent is free floating, it is taken up by an antigen presenting cell, which then presents it to a T cell, which then presents it to a B cell, and that in turn triggers the reaction of the B cell to differentiate into plasma cells, which create antibodies that then are designed to glom onto that uh, presenting foreign surface and trigger an immune response. So the intracellular uh, microbes uh, trigger the T cell reactions and the memory responses there, and the free floating antigens trigger the B cell reaction with the formation of antibodies. And when this happens, then the body is now primed to react more quickly and more uh, robustly on a secondary exposure to that same antigen um, because that memory has now been programmed into the B cells and the T cells uh, that have been um, reacting in the first encounter. So again, the two pathways, the intracellular pathway, the free floating pathway resulting in cytotoxic and memory T cells, memory B cells and antibodies. So now let's go back to that castle and think a bit about how that worked. So the defenders would try to foil the battering rams by dropping obstacles in front of them, like mattresses, piles of debris like rocks, sawdust, just before the rams had struck, or they would try to set fire to the, the wooden carriage that contained the soldiers in the ram, or they would pour burning oil on them, or they would lower a grappling hook that would catch the, the uh, ram and pick it up and pull it up out of the way so that it was useless. The ram itself, however, was not the greatest uh, danger. It was the cargo of the troops inside the cart that would be let loose once the castle wall was breached. So with COVID, we have a battering ram, which we call the spike protein. If we could somehow block or disable that COVID spike protein, then the virus, which is the in interior of the vir viral uh, uh, corp corporate body, would not be able to enter the cell. And indeed, it is the same principle. There is a spike protein that binds with a receptor on the human cell, which allows the coronavirus to enter the human cell and then to create uh, further viral particles, which are released and infecting other cells. So if we could do that, uh, block that spike protein somehow, then we would be able to perhaps um, stop the coronavirus. So we all know about the wolf in sheep's clothing. The Trojan horse is a perfect example of that, where the soldiers were inside the horse, the horse was led into the city, at nighttime they came out and ravaged the city. Or 
the wolf that puts on uh, the, the uh, sheep sheep's, uh, sheepskin and looks uh, benign and therefore is able to enter in the farmyard and go after the chickens. But what if we were to reverse that? What if we were to put a wolf's clothing on a sheep or just use the battering ram as a signal of something that was to happen? So that would alert the farmyard and the farmer that there's something dangerous coming and he would take precautions to protect against that. Or if it were the battering ram, then the castle defenders would take precautions and get ready for the real battering ram and cart with the soldiers in it that could deal um, with, uh, with the, uh, the, uh, um, the invasion itself. So forewarned is forearmed. And that is exactly the principle of what a vaccine does. A vaccine is a tiny, weakened, non-dangerous fragment of the organism that includes part of the antigen, enough that our body can learn to recognize it, build a specific antibody, so that when it encounters the real antigen again, or a part of the real organism, it already knows how to defeat it. And this is exactly what happens with COVID. This is exactly, this is really a electron microscope depiction of the spike protein of the COVID um, uh, virus. That binds to the ACE2 receptor on the human cell, which allows entry. And here's a graphic example of that. Remember, uh, Christmas time at your grandmother's house when she would t take an orange and put cloves in it. Well, that's exactly what the coronavirus looks like. Or uh, one day as I was shopping at Trader Joe's, there was this Volkswagen across the street with this apparatus on the top, which is another perfect graphic example of what the coronavirus looks like. So the goal of a COVID vaccine is to stimulate the production of antibodies to the spike protein so that when the real spike protein with its full viral complement is encountered, the programmed immune cells can quickly produce antibodies and cytotoxic T cells to destroy the coronavirus and not have it, have it infect the cell. Well, people say, well, what about if you've been infected with COVID and you already have the antibodies? Can you take those antibodies from an infected person who has recovered and use that to immunize someone who is at risk? And the answer is yes. You can take what's called plasma uh, uh, antibodies um, from, from an infected uh, person and, inf and inject that into a, another patient. And plasma taken from survivors of COVID works like this. And that works fine, but that will only last as long as that supply of antibodies is present. And there's no memory cells to trigger any further response. But if you can make your own antibodies to fight the pathogen, then you have the memory cells to continue to do that on the second exposure. And it is a long lasting effect, whereas the passive immunity is short acting. With that in mind, there are three types of coronaviruses um, vaccines in development. One is protein based, one is a viral vector, and one is a nucle nucleic acid vector or the messenger RNA. So with the protein base, you take a spike protein itself um, that is not itself in itself infectious because it doesn't have the, the rest of the coronavirus with it. You inject that into the, to the, into the patient. The immune system produces an antibody against that spike protein and also memory cells to create a secondary response if and when the true spike protein and coronavirus come along a second go round. Or you can take a piece of the spike protein, incorporate it into a, an adenovirus, a cold virus, which in, in itself is not, not infectious, but that triggers a natural response of the immune system to produce spike proteins, which then react with the immune system to produce those antibodies and T cell cytotoxic cells as well. Or you can use messenger RNA that codes for the spike protein, inject that into the patient, that triggers the body to produce spike protein because it's, it's formulated on the basis of the messenger RNA, and that again reacts with the immune system to produce antibody. And those are the three mechanisms that are currently in use for the development of vaccines. So again, here's messenger RNA coding for an antigen, 
reacting within the body to produce that antigen, which then activates the immune system to produce antibodies in immune cells. Now, let's just talk a bit about DNA versus RNA. Yes, RNA is based on DNA. It's single-stranded, and it has one significant difference between um, DNA and RNA, and that is in this position on the molecule. On the DNA is a hydrogen molecule, and on the RNA is a hydroxy molecule. And the, the, the reason that that difference is very important is that that particular change in the RNA molecule makes it very susceptible to degradation, which is why the messenger RNA vaccines have to be protected against, uh, against degradation by very low temperatures, minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit, etc. Whereas DNA um, vaccines or other vaccines, which do not have that problem, do not have that same requirement. Well, let's just talk about the different kinds of vaccines that are available. There are actual viruses, which are uh, inactivated. Um, then there are the, the, uh, the viral vectors, which we talked about, which is using an adenovirus um, to uh, bring the uh, antigen within the uh, immune system to trigger a reaction. There is the nucleic acid uh, vectors, which include the uh, DNA and the RNA. And then there's a protein-based uh, subunit, which is a virus-like particle, which is the same. Now, when I first did this presentation back in December of 2020, there were 144 vaccines being studied. And as of March of this year, there are 157. Let's just take a look at some of those, okay? So um, the difference between those uh, is that they all induce um, these T cells and B cells to react. They're non-infectious, they're egg and cell free, um, but they, they vary in their immunogenicity and they vary in uh, their need for um, uh, storage, et cetera. And that is what we're seeing in the vaccines that we're using today. Now, remember that vaccines do not prevent you from developing COVID-19. They protect you from developing a severe case of it, but it's still possible to become infected despite being properly vaccinated. So we read stories of people that have had vaccinations and still get COVID vaccine, uh, still get COVID-19, but are not as, as seriously ill. Or we read of people that have, have recovered from COVID and seem to get it again. And again, it's the same principle. Now let's look at some of those vaccines in a little more detail. So here's the um, Oxford uh, uh, AstraZeneca, which is a viral vector which has been genetically modified and using that dental virus to um, get into um, the immune system. And that only requires regular refrigerator temperature. Whereas the, whereas the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, which are the messenger RNA vaccines, um, are, need to be stored at very low temp temperatures. And they are all based on the uh, RNA mechanism and require two shots uh, which with 95% um, uh, efficacy. Now, of interest is that at University of Washington, they developed a nanoparticle with multiple computer designed spike protein antigens that's currently in phase one trials, which is being uh, studied to see if it will stimulate an immune response to those spike proteins. That would be very interesting because currently it is felt that the mutations that we're seeing are mutations of the spike protein. So if we present a variety of spike proteins with this nanoparticle to the immune system, we can build up antibodies to a multiple um, list of spike proteins and offer a wider, more generalized protection to those that get immunized with that vaccine. There's a review of uh, vaccine comparisons, um, Pfizer, Moderna, the Johnson & Johnson, which is a viral vector, on the uh, Oxford AstraZeneca. The uh, dosing schedule with Pfizer, second dose after three weeks, Moderna, second dose after four weeks, Johnson & Johnson is a one-shot dose, and Oxford uh, AstraZeneca, second dose after four to 12 weeks. Again, symptomatic disease, varying degrees of efficacy against se severe disease, really good efficacy against all of them. A brief note about uh, preclinical uh, testing, with these vaccines. In stage one or phase one, 
They're tested in cells or animals to see if an immune response is reacting. In phase uh, one, then a smaller number of people are used to test safety and dosage. Then in phase two, expand the trial with hundreds of people split into groups like children and the elderly to see if the vaccine acts differently in them. These trials then further test the vaccine safety and ability to stimulate the immune system. Phase three, thousands of people, how many people become infected versus placebo? Therefore, how, how, what degree of efficacy does it have in protection against the coronavirus? The FDA has stipulated that a vaccine must protect at least 50% of those who receive it. In addition, phase three trials must be large enough to reveal evidence of relatively rare side effects that might be missed in the earlier studies. And we're now seeing those side effects. They are rare. And we're seeing that because now we have so many more people getting the vaccine. Then following that, we have limited approval, so often on an emergency basis, which is what happened here in the U.S. in the late fall and, and early winter, um, or final approval. And in China and Russia, the uh, vaccines had not waited for the results of phase three trials. So the rush process can lead to serious risk. And then finally, there's final approval where regulators review these results and approve the vaccine or not. During the pandemic, a vaccine may receive emergency use authorization before getting formal approval. But even once a vaccine is in wide use, researchers continue to monitor people who receive it to make sure it's safe and effective. Coronavirus tracks are in December. Th these are the vaccines that were in phase one, phase two, phase three, limited and approved. And now we see in phase one, 45 vaccines currently, 33 in phase two, phase three, we now have 23, six have now been authorized and seven have been approved and four have been completely abandoned. So what now needs to be done with our vaccination program? Well, we have to continue to show that vaccines are safe. We have to have huge sale development because we need billions of potential doses for vaccination of the world's population. Regulators must review and approve the vaccine before it can be given. We still have to find out how long protection will last. Are we going to have long lasting protection like some immunizations that we get, which is for life? Or are we going to need booster doses every year as we do with the flu vaccine? Uh, the flu vaccine, the reason we get a yearly uh, flu vaccine is that each year it's slightly different because they recognize that there are mutations that occur and the flu virus over time. So we wanna modify the flu vaccine to try to cover that. So when we talk about herd immunity, we're thinking that we need to have 60 to 70% of the global population must be immune to stop the virus from spreading easily. And that means billions of people, even if the vaccine works perfectly. So in summary, the earth evolved with mechanisms of protection for life on our planet, which we've talked about earlier, we developed additional ways to protect ourselves, uh, both uh, with, uh, with external protections and then the human organism with skin, mucous membranes, and immune systems, three lines of defense at the self level. The immune response is a major means of protection of self. We've learned how to manipulate the immune, the immune response to disease with smallpox as being the prime example. And I encourage you to look at that view too when you get a chance. And vaccines definitely offer a promise. This was written in December, but now we know that it's not only a promise, but an actuality that there is efficacy in the prevention and in the treatment of COVID-19. I'm going to stop here for uh, sharing of uh, questions and comments. I have some other slides that if things come up, but I'm going to turn it back over to our moderator for participation from the other people that are in this, uh, this afternoon session. Thank you, Nick. Um, I, if you have questions, that is great. Um, we're going to hold off on them until Ira is finished, and then we can um, kind of come back around. But I want to make sure we have time for everyone to talk and ask your questions. So I'm going to hand it over now to Ira. Um, I'm going to spotlight you. <laughs> How do I do that? There you go. <laughs> yes, there <Hello>. you go. 
spotlighting a, a singer is always a fun thing. They <laughs> yeah. also, so here's Ira Allen. Well, so let's have a little bit of a ham in us, too, especially us barbershop types. Um, so I don't have a I don't have a slide presentation or anything specific I want to want to talk about because um, I want to make sure that we get to have plenty of time for questions and answers because I think everybody here wants to know a little bit also more about how how the the, the world of of choral groups and singing groups and singers in in general are dealing with this pandemic and how everything's affecting us differently than it affects other people that aren't uh, choral singers and and even uh, small group singing. Uh, even solo singers. Um, but I did want, I want to clarify a couple of things because I think it's really important for people to understand that when in Nick's presentation, we, and we hear about this, we hear about efficacy, we hear these percentages. So uh, Pfizer is 95%, has 95% efficacy and the, um, the, the AstraZeneca has 79% efficacy or whatever it is that we're not, we're not talking about for 95% efficacy. We're not talking about if 20 people get vaccinated, one out of every 20 people that gets vaccinated is gonna get the infection. That is not what that means. And it's, and it's out there on the internet, you can find experts actually saying that. And that's actually not true. And then people are not, not giving the actual information. Efficacy is a, is, is a, a function of, of a risk ratio that compares the infections in people that are vaccinated versus the infections in people that are in people that are not vaccinated. Okay, so there's a big difference between one in 20 people who are vaccinated getting infected and what true efficacy is. So when we say 95% efficacy, what we're talking about is there's a 95% reduction in infections in people that are vaccinated versus people that are not vaccinated. So if you want to put it in another way, for, for, every, uh, for every five people that are in, a, in the trials of these vaccines, for every five people who are vaccinated, I'm sorry, for every five people in the vaccinated group that turned out to get an infection after they were vaccinated, there were 100 people in the unvaccinated group that got infected. And that ratio, that five divided by 100, is where we get that 95% reduction of infection. Okay, that's something that most people don't see anywhere written and they don't understand. And it's very important. There's a big difference between, oh, I have a one in 20 chance of getting infected if I'm going to get the vaccine. That's not too good. I don't think I want to do it and get the side effects. It's a much, much, much lower risk of getting infected once you have these vaccines. So I want to just clarify, clarify that um, before I, I said a couple other things about what's going on kind of right now. Um, with with uh, the, in our state, with the state of the vaccinations, and I've been I've been volunteering in a vaccine clinic actually, and seeing some of this stuff kind of firsthand, and learning actually a little bit more as it go as I go along. And I'm no expert. I'm not a virologist. I'm not a vaccinologist. I'm a pathologist, uh, medical director of a lab. I understand lab testing. I understand statistics and numbers and things like that. Um, but what I have been doing is is keeping up with the the medical literature. Uh, paying a lot of attention, uh, checking the CDC site and looking at guidelines and what, what the current updates are. I've been attending uh, Washington State Medical Association webinars on uh, giving COVID updates from local experts, from public health, from uh, virologists in the area, UW, Swedish, Everett Clinic, and, and just trying to be like a sponge and absorb as much factual information about what's currently happening with the vaccines, with the virus, and, and where we are. None of that has to do with really with singing, but I've also been paying attention to that too and looking and, and learning about um, the, the, the risk of infection as it relates to aerosols and droplets and things like that. I don't know how many of you are aware of the, um, this, this um, uh, large um, uh, international group of, of coral groups that are supporting uh, this, this study um, of aerosolization and how it affects uh, singers and other performing groups um, uh, instrumentalists and, and dancers and, and other performing artists. Um, and I don't know how, you know, I kind of feel like I may, I may be saying things you all already know, and maybe some of you don't. So if, I, if I'm saying things that everybody already knows and stop me, and if I'm saying things that are too much over your head, stop me, I'll try to keep it at a, a layperson level. Um, but, but, but I think the questions, as you ask questions, we can delve into some of that. 
But what I did want to do, let me share one. I wanted to share one thing about the current our current state of the state of, of Washington. I'm going to see if I can do this. Let's see. Got to figure out how to share this with everybody. That's not the way to do it. <laughs> Trying to find my share button. Here we go. Can everybody see that graph? Not yet. Can, can you not see it? There we are. Do you see it? Yes. This this is just from the. Um, you see this in the newspaper. Actually, this is this is from one of the conferences. The the one I attended last Wednesday. Um, but you see this in the newspaper when they give all the statistics for the state. So I wanted to say that the things that are going on, on that are th things that are happening that are good, okay? We, we're, we, have, we have about a million people in the state that are fully vaccinated. We have about 3 million people who have had their first dose and we're getting more vaccine. Um, we were scheduled to get increasing numbers of vaccine deliveries to the state in the, in the coming weeks. So we're gonna see a ramping up. We're gonna be able to vaccinate more and more people. When I'm at the vaccine clinic, we're doing maybe 400 a day, maybe 500 people a day at the one vaccine clinic at Valley Medical Center. And we're gonna be like doubling that starting in April. So we're gonna see more and more opportunities for people wanting to get vaccinated to be vaccinated. We still have to deal with the vaccine hesitant um, and, and the people that don't want to get vaccinated for one reason or the other, but we're gonna be able to start vaccinating more and more people going forward. And this graph, <clears throat> what I want to show you is how we've done. We had that. Can you see the arrow down here on March, April? Yes. To the left. So this was our first surge. And I want you to just notice we had our second surge in the summer. And we had a huge surge over November and December around the holidays and past the holidays, which was very scary. <laughs> but we kind of knew why that was happening. People were more inside. And, and there was more, you know, people were traveling for the holidays. That just created. A, kind of a, a perfect storm of, of to have a surge before the vaccines got started. And then probably not anything to do with the vaccines, we started to see a decrease. And we've had that this after this third surge, we've had, we've come back down again. So that's the fact that we're coming back down again, ra rather briskly is a good sign. Um, let me tell you what the concerns are from the public health people, the experts in public health in the state. And this was, this was raised at the last meeting is that what we see when we when we analyze, we look at a curve like this. Uh, epidemiologists look at this, and they look at uh, the virologists, and they look and they say, "Well, look at what happens in between." When we came off the first surge, we came to a baseline that was down in this area here, uh, several hundred. These are cases, confirmed cases by test, tested positive <clears throat> cases in Washington State. We had our second surge. We came back down, and notice how the baseline is higher. The baseline that we came down to before the third surge was at about the level of our first surge. And then what's happened after the third big surge, we've come down to a baseline level, which is what? It's very close to where we were at the second surge. That's, that's concerning. Um, it's concerning that we're not, and, and remember a lot of this is before the vaccine. So what, what's happening is we're, we're, we're starting to do several things that are creating a plateau and now we're already starting to see an uptick in cases over the last week or so we're seeing an uptick in cases uptick in positive test rate so the num the number of positive tests per thousand tests that are done for instance for covid that rate is starting to creep back up again and and the fact that we are we're in a race against uh, against the vac the vaccines are in a race against the virus surge here really because what's happening is we're starting to to ease restrictions across the country and even in our state. The airports are getting busier. We've got, we've got a spring break issue with kids leaving and going places and congregating and coming back. And we've got about a hundred or more than a hundred variants that have been found in the state. That includes the variants of concern. Remember, these viruses mutate all the time. There's thousands of variants. Almost all of them mean nothing. The variants of concern, quote unquote, as defined by the CDC are the ones that we, we can show are impacting, let's say, uh, the, the, the rate of infection or the ability to, to be transmitted more easily from one person to another. So we, we're starting to see that. So we're racing against time, we're racing 
to get more people vaccinated before the number of variants that can maybe infect more people more easily catch hold and, and, and really rise. So the concern from the, the head of epidemiologists in the state is, is that he's, he's hopeful that the vaccines will, will get enough people vaccinated that this will not form a, a fourth surge at the other end of here as we're going into April and May that will, will continue to flatten out and then start dropping off again as more and more people get vaccinated that will kind of, the, vac the vaccinations will, will, will beat the variants, so to speak. So I just wanted to talk about that just a little bit to let you know kind of where we were and what some of the concerns are. Um, we, we are seeing some breakthroughs. We see some people that are vaccinated, a very small percentage of people that are vaccinated get infected afterwards after they're fully vaccinated. We know that's going to happen because we have a, a 95% effective or uh, efficacious vaccine, right? We know it's not 100%. We know that some people can still can still get infected. The good news is that for almost all of these people that get an infection after being vaccinated are having asymptomatic or mild cases of the infection. They're not hospitalized. They're not seriously ill, and they're certainly not dying. And that's why this has proved to be a very effective vaccine in fighting this virus. And um, I tell this is what I tell everyone I talk to who's hesitant is just, just to, that they're not sure how this thing is, is working and want to wait and see. We've seen millions, millions of people being vaccinated. The latest data from the, um, the MMWR, which is the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report uh, in, the, in the, so, so nationwide reporting, 14 million people have been vaccinated over a period of a month vaccinated. 14 million, seven, well, this is actually after, so actually, let me come back to that. What I want to say is, is the stud, the few studies that are actually looking at the effectiveness of the vaccine in real world, in the real world, not in the studies. So the 95% of efficacy in the studies is one thing. We want to look at the effectiveness in the real world. We're seeing a very high effectiveness so far in the early studies. You, some of you may have heard about the study Studies come out of Israel where they're vaccinating a lot more people than we are, than one of the highest vaccination rates in the world right now. And they're, they're looking at data in healthcare workers. There's a study in California looking at data in healthcare workers and one in Texas. There's been three studies showing very high effective, effectiveness in the vaccine, decreasing the rate of infection in those that are fully vaccinated. Um, I can go into some numbers if you want to hear them, but I think that the, the message is that the early data is, is very, very positive. I think the Israeli data was like 91 and a half percent decrease uh, of reduction, 91 and a half percent reduction in infections in vaccinated healthcare workers versus non-vaccinated healthcare workers in their healthcare system. And uh, that's again, 91%, 95%. Those are very high rates of effectiveness in the vaccine's ability to stop infection in vaccinated people. Um, and again, when they did, when these few patients or people that were vaccinated did get sick, most of them didn't get sick, they were asymptomatic. They were just tested and happened to be, be COVID positive, most of them. Some of them had some mild, mild infection symptoms, but, but uh, the idea that it's stopping severe disease, hospitalization and death in everyone is very, very positive. And similar data from California and Texas, very, very low rates of breakthrough infections after vaccination. So I want, let me stop there and, and, and just open this up. And what I think, I think what we need to do is talk a little bit, get some questions. I want to, I have some things to say about singing, um, some of the environment, uh, environments of singing that I've experienced personally. And, and we've tried through um, the, the, the barbershop world and, and in particular, the Northwest Sound Chorus who I uh, sing with and my quartet uh, has been singing in, we started singing in person outdoors in the height of the pandemic in April. We were just singing outside six to eight feet apart um, uh, under, underneath a cover so that we weren't you know, affected by the, the, the rain. And before it got too, um, I think it got warmer and warmer. We were actually doing fine through the summer, uh, even through the second surge and, and uh, did very well. So it, it, without just starting to talk about a lot of things related to singing in choral groups and what's safe, I, want, I don't know what level of, of knowledge people have about aerosolization studies that have been done, um, I, uh, studies that have, been, that have been put out to choral societies or information that's been distributed with choral groups and singing groups and, and uh, public school systems about how to get 
um, musicians back into performing again. So just, I'd rather have it open up the question so I know what level of question to answer before I just talk. And we have a question from Lars, uh, Ira, that you might that you might respond to in the chat room. And can I just say, uh, this is Wendy McKee. I am um, have a great background here, and I am also the vice president of the board of the GSCC. And um, I always end up being the one that likes to uh, hit the bee's nest with the with the stick, and that's kind of my job. And I I have to come out and say that anything that is said here. Um, it cannot be taken as advice from GSCC. These are all just guidelines and things that are said. So uh, audio, and I think uh, someone's battery ran out. So I heard a little uh, low battery announcement, and then we lost your audio. Oh, my audio. Can can you hear me? Yes. I don't have. Okay, you. I don't. I don't have an, a low battery thing. So I apologize. I'm not sure where that came from. Um, so uh, please take anything that's said here as a guideline that GSCC is in no way advocating that you can start up your choral rehearsals um, in any way. These are all guidelines and um, but no matter how badly we all want to get back to singing, we all do, um, that we are offering guidelines and um, not advocating and are not legally responsible for anything that you should choose to do based on what is said here today. And I'm sorry, that's my, the end of my legalese talk for right now. But, and thank you to everybody who's, you know, Ira and I the medical think, I, I think that's an important comment because uh, we're not making recommendations or trying to give people medical advice or group advice or singing advice. We're just trying to present information that people have been reviewing and trying to interpret it in a way that people can understand because so much of it is difficult to understand. And it's also mixed information with two different sides of the picture. At least that's that's my my feeling of what my role is. And I think Ira is probably doing the same thing. We're trying to educate people with information. And yeah. So Absolutely, I, and we appreciate uh, it so much. We need this information desperately. We just don't want everybody to hang their hats on everything that's right. said. So thank right. you so much, thank you. And we're, we're not, and Nick and I are not, like I said, we're not public health experts. <laughs> um, we're, not, we're not CDC representatives or, or Department of Health experts. We're physicians who have some knowledge base and are interested in, in, in learning factual science-based information and passing that on to people. And, and people will make, the, will make their own decisions about what they can, can and want to do. Uh, I think a key point to remember is that we don't have some answers. We don't have, there are studies ongoing about whether or not the vaccines will and how much they will impact transmissibility, how long they will be effective at, at um, uh, providing you know, protection from the virus. I noticed there was a question about what do we know about long COVID in patients that are vaccinated? I don't think, I, I haven't seen, there may be something out there, maybe a study ongoing. I haven't seen any preliminary information about the vaccine and its effectiveness at preventing long COVID because long COVID can be seen in people who have milder infections. So, so I don't know if the vaccine, if the mild infection in a, in a patient who's been vaccinated is different than a mild infection, mild infection in someone who was not vaccinated as it relates to the development of long COVID. I mean, you can postulate, but someone who really puts a lot into a lot of credence into science-based information we just don't have that information yet but we do know there are studies being done currently that are going to look that are looking at transmissibility um, i think uh, dr fauci even mentioned that it's it'll be about four or five maybe six months before we know some of that um, get have some results from those studies and know a little bit more about that in the meantime that's why we're being asked after being vaccinated to continue to wear masks when we're around unvaccinated people who are who are at risk or if we're out in public. Uh, the new guidelines say that we could uh, someone who's vaccinated like like me, if Heather's not vaccinated, I could go visit Heather and we would not need to wear masks and, and social distance. And I think that's just based on the actual risk, uh, the risk, the relative risk. Uh, remember, there's absolute risk and there's relative risk. You know, is there some risk that that I could have been infected and don't know it and could infect Heather or vice versa? Yes. 
but the relative risk for two people getting together at the current prevalence of, of COVID in the, in the community would put the risk of us getting together and, and, and being together inside a room without masks and without social distancing, that chance of, of, of uh, having an infection spread that way is very, very small. Probably, and again, this is just a rough ballpark figure based on numbers that come out of the Georgia Tech seroprevalence data, it's probably considerably less than 1%. Um, I could tell you right now that this is an important figure to know as you're thinking about, am I gonna get together with 10 people in my backyard six feet apart and sing. I think it's important to know, and this is our quartet was kind of looking at this as we were deciding to stop, to stop singing together. Even the four of us, when November came along, we started to see these increasing rates of prevalence in the state with the th that third large surge. But I can tell you right now, if you look at 10 people, based on the current estimates and the models coming out of that, the Georgia Tech zero prevalence data for the whole country, they can do it by county. You can look at it by county in King County, what they did was that, that you can you can look at the so, so many number of people together, you can you can enter in what you think the prevalence rate is or how, how much how much there is more than the reported prevalence of the of the virus positive cases in the, in that area. So if you if you consider whatever's being reported in King County as current prevalence rate of the disease. If we multiply that times three and say if it's going to be conservative, we're going to say it's three times that reported rate because a lot of people who are asymptomatic obviously could have the infection, but we wouldn't even know about it. Or let's even talk about five times. Let's say it's five times the actual reported rate of the disease. If 10 people would get together in King County, the chance that at least one of those people has COVID is only 5%. Okay, so that's, that's pretty low. So that's again, that's less than one out of those 20 people, half of those 20 people, okay, um, or 10, I'm sorry, 10 people, 5% of those 10 people. So it's, it's, it's way less than one out of it's a less, there's a really good chance that none of those 10 people have COVID, right? There's a very low chance that, that, that you're going to have a problem with 10 people. And then if you're outside, and then we'll talk about, we can talk about this some more, where you are doing your performing matters a lot. And you probably all know this by now, but if you're inside in a poorly ventilated place versus outside with the air exchange happening every literally every second the air is exchanging uh, going away from you and the people that you're around um there's a huge difference we're not seeing we're not seeing covid being spread uh, there's not a big transmissibility component happening from groups of people that are outside um, especially if they're outside and they're not you know right up against each other talking into each other's faces um so th these things make a difference. The, no understanding the relative rate of, of the prevalence of disease may, may make a difference in your decision, but it's ultimately a personal decision as to how much risk would one person want to take and how much risk as a choral group or any singing group would want to take. Um, and we don't even know those numbers. We don't know the absolute risk. All we know is that there's relatively less risk or more risk in certain situations. Um, there was uh, the question that one did one yeah. answer this question. Yeah, I have a, I, I have a few. Like I've I've kind of put them in order for you you two for both okay. you and yeah. Again. I'm not seeing the chats as they're coming. That's okay. <laughs> so the first one is um, with a with a change to phase three here in Washington, um, and th which allows people to be closer together and. Um, what was the other thing there? Uh, you know, the six feet of distances, but then it was three feet and all this stuff. What do you feel as um, as regulations loosen? What is our responsibility as individual ensembles to be more restrictive, or, or what are what do you feel are are good kind of guidelines of how to go about that? Um, with especially with concerns of a you know a fourth wave kind of coming and our numbers are going back up. Um, I, I think their question is just kind of what. What what are some good benchmarks to kind of keep watching as we try to to see if we can come back together or be in the same room? Well, I think I, I mentioned one benchmark, yeah. just keep keep a, keep tabs on these on the actual relative risks given group sizes. And I can I I'm not sure how to do this, but I could I could send this to you, Heather. Afterwards, is I can send the link to the Georgia Tech website where you can actually look at this data. It's updated like daily. And, and you can look at seroprevalence data and what they look at again is the risk, the risk with any given number of people in a group 
um, that one of those people has, at least one of those people has COVID based on the current seroprevalence data in that geographic area that you're, you're wanting to look at. So I will, I will get that information and send it out to everybody. I, I've been watching that kind of off and on throughout the whole pandemic. And at some point in King County, we were up to somewhere around 15 or maybe even 20% uh, chance that one person in a group of 10 had COVID. I mean, that was, that's really high. And now we're down to, you know, five, three to 5%, depending on, on how much more uh, prevalence you, you want to throw into the mix and say, well, well we're going to look at three times the reported incidence or five times the reported incidence to take into account the asymptomatic people that aren't uh, showing up as, as positives in the, case, in the case reporting. So that's one way that you can look at this. Um, the other way is, is to understand that the, uh, and again, I don't know how many people have looked at these the studies, this, this large internationally you know, funded study of aerosolization as it relates to, to performing groups, but it's, it's clearly been shown that the, that the aerosolization that occurs when someone is singing is greater than someone who is just talking or breathing normally. And that's where a lot of this, uh, this the concept of the, of the distance that we need to stay away from someone else and, and be safe uh, has come from. So, you know, the, the guidelines are not, the guidelines coming out of the state are not geared towards singers. And performers. So I don't think I think we have to, as individual groups, we have to decide. Like Northwest Sound is trying to come up with reasonable ways to approach this. Um, uh, particularly before everyone's vaccinated, most of the group is has decided. Look, we're just not going to get together in person when we have maybe half the people vaccinated, half the people aren't. We're certainly not going to get together indoors and try to do rehearsals like we used to. It's we don't we don't want to as a group take that risk. And it may come down to individuals who say, okay, I've been vaccinated. I feel comfortable singing in this environment when I know that the HVAC system is, is circulating the air at a certain number of turnover uh, turnovers per hour in this room. I'm comfortable doing that. It's become a, often it will become a personal decision um, as to when to do that. Nick, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, I think uh, I'm looking at some of the questions in the chat rooms here about the aerialization, et cetera. My recollection, I haven't read the, haven't looked at it recently, is that it's not a six foot distance, but it's more like a 10 or 11 foot distance when you're singing because you're producing a lot more air and a lot more force behind it. And therefore the distance um, for protection against uh, sharing of germs or whatever uh, has to be increased. Someone, Nancy Rabel asking about tuberculosis versus uh, COVID and uh, with tuberculosis, it's really the same thing. It's aerosolized. And that's why in medicine, we always uh, check people who have household contacts for TB um, because, they're, because they're at higher risk. Um, so the question about um, asking group members to identify their vaccine status, huh, which is private medical information, maybe tied to medical conditions they don't want to share. You know, I was just reading before the meeting about the, a COVID passport that Biden and about 123 other agencies are, are looking at to show proof of vaccination as a way for um, freedom of travel, et cetera. And I don't know where that's gonna go, but that may be something that we may, may end up with. I'll just share a personal story. I traveled once uh, as a medical student in the Caribbean and I got stopped at one of the islands because I my smallpox vaccination wasn't up to date. And you have to carry it in those days a vaccination card with you showing all your vaccinations. So I had to spend the night in, in one of the islands waiting to get a smallpox vaccination um, in order to be able to continue traveling. So this COVID, this COVID vaccination passport may be something that, may, that we may be seeing. The question is, are people gonna feel comfortable about singing with other people that have not been vaccinated? And by extension, how are we going to deal with people in the audiences that we sing to who are coming in and sharing that space with us? I don't have answers for that, but I know that, that churches, et cetera, are looking at that. My church, St. James Cathedral, has had open services for a time with a limited number of people with physical spacing inside, and that seems to be working well. They actually have singers and, um, and organists, et cetera, but with distancing there. 
those are good questions. I don't have the answers to them. Um, Ira, you got some ideas? Well, first, let me, my own, yeah. Let me share one other thing I wanted to, because it relates to these, quite, some of these questions that are coming up, um, if I can find it. Oh, where did it go? Can you see what I'm sharing? Can, can, it, can you see this? Not As yet. A, Not yet. You don't see it? Um, you have to put it on your desktop and then access it. Yeah, I thought I had done that. Um, let's see here. Oh, here we go. You see it now? Yeah, it's, yeah. Okay, so this is something the Barbershop Harmony Society just recently put out. And, and a lot of this is based on what the, um, uh, some of these other uh, choral organizations are doing. And, it, and it, I think it's based as well on the aerosolization studies that are currently being done. Um, this is that International Coalition of Performing Arts Aerosol Study. So there's some discussion about this and there's some links in this. So th this is something else I could send. Again, I don't know how to send it out right now, but it's got links to some, some, some things that are, would be helpful to answer some of these questions. But it does talk about, let me get to the singing part. Um, uh, here's that aerosol study, preliminary results of this aerosolization study. Um, just trying to find, right, so, so, um, some of this is, is recommendations from those studies where they talk about um, uh, gu guidance for rehearsal space. This is it's in this area here, if you, can, if you can read that, talking about the preferences for where, where rehearsing might be considered more or less safe. And again, it's all relative risk. It's not that, oh, we sing outdoors, every, everyone's safe, doesn't matter whether you're vaccinated or not. It's all, there's always factors that you have to consider. Um, and it's a personal preference thing. My, my understanding, you know, understanding how the virus spreads, understanding the, the aerosolization studies actually attending, I attended the, the webinar where, where these the, the studies were being discussed, where they were talking about what they were finding in the aerosolization studies and, and, and how you could actually measure how far out a singer would project aerosol versus someone who's playing a trumpet versus someone who's playing a clarinet and th things like that. Um, I, understanding how that works and, and in an environment where there's no airflow, I, you can see what the risk might be. But I'm also pretty convinced just on my, just, and it's not based on, because we can't test this, <laughs> can't test it. But I'm, I'm convinced that if you're outdoors six to 10 feet apart and singing, the, the risk of catching COVID through aerosolization is, is very, very small. And again, it's not zero. But it's 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 very small. It's not where we're seeing uh, um, transmission coming from and people getting sick from that kind of environment. But when they they list they'll list these you know descending order of preference. If you're going to be indoors, you want to have some level of airflow, and that's the key here. The key is airflow. The key is getting rid of virus that's in the environment, so that the the, the dosage of the it's 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 whether you get sick or not is the, related to the dosage you're exposed to and the time you're exposed to it. So even if there was a relatively large dose of virus coming out in someone who was singing, who was, let's say one day before they became sick, they, did, they were asymptomatic, but they were gonna get sick in a day and they were, they were shedding virus. So they're shedding virus out. If I was standing six feet away from them and I'm outside and the airflow, there's a, maybe there's a lot of virus in that aerosolization, but the airflow is coming through and there's a little, it doesn't even have to be much of a breeze to move the air away within a matter of a second or two. The actual exposure is diminished. And that's why you, we're, not, we're not seeing that, that as, a, as a, a large mode of transmission. Um, again, not zero, but that's the way you wanna rehearse. At least as the weather gets warmer, I think rehearsing outside is, is gonna be the key with, with small groups uh, particularly, and, and then even later with large groups. And there's also recommendations here with regard to um, if you are rehearsing inside, how often, and you can find these in that uh, aerosolization paper, I think. One of, these, one of these references talks about 
Um, if you are indoors, to, to that you have a 30 minute rehearsal and then you take a break and let the room air clear out and then you come back and do another 30 minutes. So there's some specific recommendations from the aerosolization studies specifically for singing groups as to ways to, to, to optimize the chance of, of not having coronavirus uh, transmission in that setting. Um, I think this would be, would be one to take a look at this preliminary study. This is one that actually came out in August and they're still doing these studies. So there's probably more information that will come later. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to just share. And I, again, I could send this along with that link. I have a couple of things I could send to Heather and Heather, maybe you could get out to the whole group. Uh, yeah. people, people email I'm, this later. Yeah, I'm collecting a few. Some people have sent other links as well and I will put it all together. Oops. Okay. There we go. No one can see me. Um, I'll put it all together um, and 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 send it out along with this is being recorded, and so we'll send the link to that as well. So you'll have some more resources. And um, Lynette Finstead had a question. If she can come on, she said she needs to explain it verbally, not in the chat. So if Lynette, if you want to unmute yourself and and ask your question. Yes. And again, I am the uh, team coordinator for a. Sweet Adeline's chorus related to barbershop singing here in Portland, Oregon. And it sounds like that myself and people in our chorus have done a lot of what Ira has been doing, you know, the research, research, research out there. And including I'm in contact with the theater union here in Portland to find out what their guidelines are for performing, et cetera. And I just wanted to share that, um, one of the frustrations that you mentioned is that there's information out there everywhere. You know, I have a copy of what you just shared with BHS's information. I have the Sweet Adeline's International information. I have the National Association of Teachers of Singing information and yada, 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 and finding a direction on where to go. And so I just want, what I wanted to share about the CDC is one of my research things that I was doing just last week was to, and I'm sorry, I don't have the actual document to pull up right now. I can find it and send it to Heather later, but I just Googled um, on a CDC website information for event coordinators for outdoor performances and came up with information in there and there was like a 10 page checklist for event organizers to use as far as how you space your audience out six feet apart and then one of the guidelines in there at that time was the audience needs to be at least 12 feet away from the performers and you know you need to have sanitation supplies and bathrooms and yada yada but there is a 10 page checklist that just came out and it was um, like the week of March 22nd. And I can look back in my documents that I've been saving and send that information to Heather. I don't have it right now, but if as performers, if you just Google that with CDC to see, you know, and then it also referred to a lot of what Ira was just saying too, you know, looking at the HVAC systems, et cetera, when you are indoors. And so the CDC is putting out some of this information that seems like it will answer some of the questions that are popping up in chat. So that's just what I wanted to share. Yeah. You know, the, the, the thing we're all looking for is someone to say, it's safe to do this this way, do it this way. And that's what's so frustrating because no one's going to say, this is what you should do and you will be safe because we just don't have that risk-free, you know, option. So we're, I, I just, I was thinking about this before we got on the, the session and I was thinking, I was actually trying to look up the data and couldn't find it. Maybe Nick, you might know this, but I was trying to look up, you know, we, before COVID, we'd all sing together. We'd all do things together. We'd be at parties or whatever. We'd be with a hundred people, no mask, talking loudly over a lot of noise. And we had flu pandemics going on, right? There was always some level of risk. We always, right. you know, no one, no one thought, oh, I'll never get the flu. People thought, oh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to not do these things. I'll take the chance. I might get the flu. Um, so, you know, I think at some point we're going to get to the point where we say, you know, where we see that the, the, the risk levels are low and, and it would be really be nice that the CDC would come out and give us some comparative data to things like the flu and say, well, 
coronavirus, just getting the regular cold. What were our, what was the seroprevalence? What was our chances of getting a cold, right? So, you know, some of that information would be helpful when you're thinking of relative risk. But if we're all waiting for the time where there's zero chance of being infected with coronavirus to get back and sing, we'll never sing again together. You know, I just don't think that's going to be an option. I think we're all at some level going to accept a small amount of risk. And if every, let's say I see a thing here about if everyone is vaccinated, can they be in the same room? And do you think that applies to singers? Well, if 20 people are fully vaccinated with, the, with this vaccine, now right now with the information we have right now and what we know right now with the potential for a small number of breakthrough people getting infected, but having very only mild illness or asymptomatic illness or asymptomatic infection, those 20 people, I would say, absolutely. You, you could sing together in a room without masks and there's a low risk that, that there could be potentially someone get an asymptomatic COVID infection. So you, you could do it. You have to just realize there is that very small risk. Um, at some point, we're going we're gonna, to, we're, unless we're all willing to, to continue doing this masking and social distancing, even when everyone's vaccinated, you know, I, which I don't think is going to be feasible and practical, you know, we're, at some point, we're going to have to accept and find where our own risk tolerance level is as an individual and also as a performing group and and the performing groups need to talk about it. like i said northwest sound ha has a group that's actually looking at try how are we going to start back up again when we feel comfortable what's going to make us comfortable enough again to sing together in certain environments and we have a couple of docs on our in the course uh, i don't know if you all know Ch chuck kaplan is in that course and i am and so they'd ask us to give input and feedback about about that because they all wanted to get back as soon as the vaccine started. And we said, no, no, it's too soon. You know, we just don't have enough information and we just, it's, it's too risky. Um, but I can tell you how, I don't know how many of you have kept up with some of the things that other groups are doing as far as um, uh, the, the outdoor or the, 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 what we call carber shopping, <laughs> the barbershop groups that are singing, that are setting up uh, outdoor in, um, uh, groups where, where you, you, you uh, for what Northwest Sound is doing, we, we found a spot at the uh, Bellevue Square Mall in, in the parking lot. We asked the permission for the operations people there. Can we come with 20, maybe 25 cars? And we set up the, the carber shopping thing that you see. And I know that Elizabeth Davies is doing this with the Seattle uh, chorus, the C, C chords and barbershop uh, chorus. Um, and there's a central soundboard, the directors outside, you know, on the soundboard with a headset on, everyone's in their car. And, and the, the, the feedback is coming through an FM channel. Everyone's got a wireless mic and we're each individually singing into the sound of the group that we're hearing through the soundboard that's coming back through the FM stereo. So we're actually having a rehearsal where we can sing with the ensemble sound. We can hear everyone singing. It's not optimal, but it's better than virtually where we really can't sing at all because of all the latency issues that you have in a, in a Zoom meeting. That has worked. We're just starting to do it. And we, as each week we do it, it gets even better and better. Um, and the late, latest I saw was an email from the, the guy who's coordinating all the technical stuff is that we're also now going to have the capability. We have an audio um, device that will allow someone to, to, to enter the, the rehearsal through Zoom and we can feed them the ensemble sound back through the sound system so that in their Zoom at home, their Zoom uh, uh, meeting, or rehearsal, they can hear what everyone's doing in the, in the group that's singing in their cars and sing along with them. So we've been able to actually make, make progress in doing things like that in the meantime until we can get back together in person, which are better than just the virtual meeting alone where it's hard to, to sing or perform together. Um, so there, there are things that can be done. Like I said, small groups, quartets, eight, you know, eight groups of eight or 10 outside with distancing. That's, I, I don't think that is a problem. And again, that's my opinion. We don't have any studies where someone actually looked at groups of people singing outside and how many people got sick, but it's not been something that's been reported. We certainly don't have evidence that that is a major source of transmission when small singing groups are outside singing. And I think it's actually one of the recommendations through the, um, uh, I know that the aerosolization study, I think talked about it, but I know the Barbershop Harmony Society has talked about small groups outside, appropriately spaced, and they even mentioned even better to have, if there's a breeze at all, have it at your back and, and heading you know, away from the group. Um, so there are some options to, to pursue in that regard.
Great. I, there's a few questions coming in the chat. I want to circle back to one that, that came up a while ago and we hadn't addressed yet, and that is the mixture between youth and adults um, in spaces when it comes to education, uh, choral education, or um, some of our youth ensembles that are youth singers, but I have adult leaders um, and is there any more concern, different concern um, because they're not going to be vaccinated uh, at this time or have a chance to do it? Um, Nick or Ira, anyone, <laughs> either one of you? Um, generally speaking, it looks like COVID-19 does, it doesn't affect younger people as seriously as it affects older people, just generally speaking. But you also read about the 11 year old that got COVID-19 and died, you know, I mean, that kind of thing. So uh, the immune system is different, you know, in kids uh, and adults, the immune system tends to um, deteriorate with adults over time, which is why cancer is more common and the older that you get, because our immune system doesn't react as well to foreign or different looking cells. But that doesn't tell us anything about singing with an adult leader in kids. Unfortunately, um, the, the, um, the, somebody asked a question about um, wearing masks. Um, so the interesting observation that has been made is that because of the wearing of masks for COVID, the morbidity and mortality and incidence of flu has significantly dropped over this past year because people were wearing masks. So masks work. Yeah, and the aerosol, aerosolization study showed that the masks significantly decreased the aerosolization spread. Uh, again, they're in a very controlled setting where they could look at where the aerosol, how far it would travel, how long it would be there. Um, but the masks definitely make a difference. So if the kids are masked, there's definitely going to be less aerosol spread. A lot of what, what comes out gets caught in the mask, Either drop, not just droplets of the aerosol. And there's less potential for spread. Again, it comes down to some idea of, or this concept of relative risk for a teacher who has two comorbid conditions and is over 65 years old they, and is not vaccinated. Okay. Their risk is much higher, right? Than someone who's a 40 year old and is vaccinated and has no comorbid, comorbid uh, conditions. Their risk is a small risk that potentially they could get an asymptomatic infection or maybe even possibly a mild infection, but it'd be very low risk because they, if they've been vaccinated very low. And, and again, the, the risk we're seeing out of these studies is, is on the order of like five in 10,000 people or two in, I think one of them was two, what was it, two in a thousand from California, it was two in a thousand. Um, these are uh, of a thousand people that, that got vaccinated. Only two of them, when after they were fully vaccinated, only two of them tested positive. They tested all these people, right? They tested them and only two of them were positive after they were fully vaccinated. So we're talking about very low rates of what they call breakthrough infection. And again, at very minimal amounts of infection, if anything. So I think the risk to a teacher in those environments is, the, again, it's there, but it's very, very small. And their individual risk might, they may say, yeah, yeah I have heart disease and diabetes and I'm 68 years old. I don't think I should be taking that risk yet until I get vaccinated. Um, so. Uh, and don't forget the three foot rule that came out. The state mentioned thing about kids can be three feet apart, not six feet apart, it makes it easier to bring them back to school. That doesn't apply to anybody else. That's just the kids seated there. The teacher should, should try to stay you know, away from them further. Okay. Um, good, we have, I, we have one question that wanted to be asked verbally and that's Michael Cartwright. Is Michael around? There he yes. Is. Hi Ira, how you doing? I say sing with Tacoma and, and what sound for us. Yeah, I recognize uh, you. Yeah, and uh, Dominique, I sing over St. Olaf over in Paulsville, so I've been at the cathedral a few times. Good to see you. Hey, my question or concern is, sometime in the future, we're going to have to say, okay, it's time to open things up. No masking. It's going to happen sometime, whether it's next month or next year or two years, that's going to happen. Okay. My concern is, if you look at what happened over the summer, the U.S. stayed relatively open, even though some states were in lockdown, but Europe went off in a total lockdown, and their case rate was really, really low. Ours stayed high. But then Spain, Italy, France, all those countries opened up, and their cases skyrocketed. I mean, they went through the roof. They went racing past us for their death rates. So my concern is we got to keep things at a low level here until we get 80% of the world vaccinated, 
then it's okay, we can start relaxing as everything else. And then we get that skyrocket then because of unforeseen circumstances that we didn't foresee or couldn't test or whatever. Now we have this whole eight, six billion vaccine tax days we've done maybe have been no good, potentially. So why don't why are we being so uh, prohibitive now? Not saying we're an answer here, but you have conduits. You may be able to ask that question, Ira or Dominic. Find out, well, maybe here's another way to look at it. Open up now. If you've been fully vaccinated, you need no restrictions. Find out how it spreads now. We've only done 5 10% of the, of the world, the country, whatever. We thought, oh, this isn't working. Maybe we need to rethink now instead of a year from now when it happens. You see my point? You see what I'm saying there? Mm-hmm. And uh, it seems like now's the time to start testing the real world instead of a year from now. <laughs> you know, does that make sense to you? Well, what, what you're saying is, is let's, let's all of us in the public, in the public sector be the guinea pigs, right? <laughs> it's going to happen either now or sometime in the future. Would you rather find out now and say, okay, we need to re-engineer some of these vaccines now before giving to everybody else and find out a year from now, oh, those vaccines aren't going to be just we thought through. We need to go back and rethink it again. You know, I'm, I'm uh, really optimistic about what I see as being the number of cases and the prevalence of the incidents dropping. And yeah. just with the very robust response for vaccinations that we've had in the past month. So I would prefer to wait a couple of more months to see okay. what those rates do, because I th- yeah. I'm very optimistic that they're going to continue the drop and that we will reach a level where we can be more tolerant about being open with safety and less risk. Okay. Uh, so um, I would, the yeah. other thing is that two, two other parts to this. Number one, we don't know how long the effectiveness of the vaccine will last <laughs> as we do with flu. And number two, if we get a lot more mutations, which the vaccine that we currently have do not protect against, then it's really basically a different disease. It's yeah. just a different virus. And we may see the same thing happen all over again. So I think the additional data that we're going to be getting over the next couple of months is going to be very, very useful and very reassuring, actually. Yeah, I, I agree with Nick. I think what we're going to see, like I mentioned before, we're, we're rate the vaccine was a race as a race, the vaccination yeah. against the, the variants and things like that. I think what we're going to see is a, is a small, and this is just my opinion about it, based on what I'm hearing from the experts, because what I see their concerns <laughs> on, yeah. looking, is that we're going to see a small bump up. We've plateaued and we're going to see a small fourth surge. It's not going to be like the one we saw in the winter, but because as that's happening, more and more people are getting vaccinated. And so it's going to blunt that surge. And then we're going to see this big drop off the more and more people get vaccinated. And I think what I agree about Nick with, with Nick is about, uh, we've got studies already ongoing that are more scientifically um, being, being the, the, they're being performed in a more scientific way is what I'm trying to say, looking at, how, the effectiveness of the vaccine over time. Yeah. Oh, We've got yeah. studies that are currently going on with children. We've got studies currently going on with pregnant women. We've got a lot of stuff in the hopper that over the next, I would say next three to five months, we're going to have a lot more great information to allow us to open up with more, more confidence. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to see booster shots. I think, I don't think this <laughs> probably this, yeah. it's gonna be like the flu where you need a flu shot every year or every other year. It's not going to be like the measles where you don't need another shot. It just lasts kind of forever. I think that's what we're going to see. Don't <laughs> on it, but I, I think based on all the science I'm seeing, that's going to happen. So I agree with Nick. I think if you just open everything up right now before we're, before we're fully vaccinated. Well, I'm not saying everybody does those who have been back, who have been fully vaccinated, can't get to back to some sense of normalcy to see how they are affected by the vaccine. Instead of finding out a year from now when everybody's vaccinated, then we get this big explosion of cases when we've had a small explosion of cases now where we can do where we can take measures now instead of a year from now. Yeah, I, th- I, hear, I hear you, Mike. You yeah. know, it's, it's, and you guys have the, the contacts and know what's going on that we don't know as laymen. I'm just saying that's kind of what I see as one of my concerns Yeah, because I think of what's happened in Europe, you know, with their being in lockdown and exploding on them. Yeah, but well, it, let's it remember too that 
exploded on them because they weren't vaccinated either. Yeah, so, I understand. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. My my biggest my my biggest take home message for everyone I talk to, and and you, and you can't convince people who are hesitant or not that are hesitant, but you can't convince people that just don't believe the science or don't trust yeah. them. But but my biggest talking point is the quicker everyone gets vaccinated, the quicker we're at the point where you want to be Mike. <laughs> yeah, I know. Before. And, and trying to get people that I, I have my problem, my own kids who want to kind of wait there to, I don't know, this is all new. I'm not so sure about this. I'm, <laughs> I'm young and healthy. If I get COVID, I'm probably not going to be that sick. I'm not sure I want to do this vaccine yet. You know, so it's hard to convince people. And my job isn't necessarily to convince them, but to, to educate and make sure they yeah. understand the facts. Because a lot of the, there's 99% or more of the information on the internet is garbage. Okay. It's misinformation. There's a lot of noise on the internet. <laughs> you can't get the signal when the signal is one one thousandth of the noise, right? It's yeah. hard to find the, the truth, right? So I'm trying to get the truth of people when they tell me things like, oh, the vaccine can get in your DNA and it'll be in your cells. For <laughs> There's so much out there that's not true. Yeah. Um, and so my, my goal is to try to educate people and say, look, this vaccine, here's the bottom line. This vaccine is one of the most effective vaccines we've developed very effective, much more so than the flu. Um, it's very effective, or at least it's very, it's efficacious and it's looking like it's gonna be extremely effective as well. Effect, effectiveness is, is in the real world, efficaciousness is from the study. It's also very safe. We haven't talked much about that yet. The safety of this has been shown so far to be, it, it causes, yes, people have an immune response, they get symptoms, they go away in a day or two for the most part and people don't have bad reactions that create hospitalization or severe illness. Even the anaphylactic reactions in the very small percentage of people that have an actual like allergic, severe allergic reaction, they're, they're monitored, it happens very quickly. They're, they can be given epinephrine and they're fine. Hours later, next day, they're fine. We're not seeing people getting sick from this vaccine. Now, do we know the long-term effects? My daughter says, what, what if they turn, this could turn us into zombies six months from now. <laughs> and I explained to her, if we, if we waited, if we waited a year to find out if there was some longer term effect from the vaccine, we, we just, we're just going to be stuck in this pandemic even longer. So we have to go with what we know. We have to go with what we know about how vaccines work from previous vaccines. And we know the science of the messenger RNA vaccines. This is not new science. This has been around for about what a decade, uh, 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 Nick, uh, this, the science of using messenger RNA as the vector in the vaccine. They've been testing this and, and trying to make a safe vaccine using messenger RNA. And this is the first time they've been forced to actually, okay, we're gonna use it and we're gonna use it quickly. Uh, and and the, 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 the speed of this thing, bad name, warp speed was a bad name because that connotes that those, something was skipped or that they, they were leaving things out and they didn't. They just did everything in parallel instead of in series. So as they had enough information from trial one, they went to, to uh, the first the phase one trials, they went to phase two. As they had enough information phase two, they went to phase three. They didn't wait for one to finish to start another one, then that finished and start another one. And they were producing the vaccine at the same time they were doing the trials, which never happens when you're making vaccines in the real world. So what we did was the government gave these companies all the money and carte blanche to say, look, we're gonna take the risk. You make the millions of vaccines even before we know it's effective. That's why it happened so fast. So it's nothing to do with safety or the process being skimped upon or being skimped on. It was just the, 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 the resources being put behind it um, were adequate enough to get it done quickly. So I try to explain these kinds of things to people who are hesitant about the vaccine. And yet people will make their own decisions and you know that's, that's their, their choice. But, but again, the quicker we all get vaccinated, the quicker we're out of this pandemic. Take a shots on Thursday. <laughs> I know one one observation. I know you're talking about the, the the case rate is leveling off again, but the death rate is still dropping. It's probably gonna you know be lower than it has been for a long time. The what rate? Death rate. Death yeah. Rate. Well, part of the death rate going down is not related to the case rate. It's related to our ability to treat the disease better. And the folks are getting the the vaccine. Well, no, it's actually related more to the way we're treating patients in the hospital. We're able, we're able to take critical patients and save their lives. Um, so I look more at the positivity rate, pot number, the, the percent of cases, the percent of tests that are positive 
and that chart that I showed you, the actual case rate, what it's what it's doing, right? So they're affected by vaccine, right? But if you look at the positivity rate, that's going up a little bit too. So we have a couple of things that are raising a little bit of concern. But like I said, I think we may see a little bit of a rise as a fourth, a fourth, uh, uh, little fourth, fourth hump, right? And then come back down again. I think we'll catch up. We're getting enough people vaccinated now that we're not going to see this huge surge unless a, a variant shows up that that is, you know, multitudes more infective than the ones that we have that we're even concerned about. And so far, we haven't seen that. But we got to go with what we know. Yeah. Well, you can have a disease that stop dying from a disease that stop dying from a disease. That's also good. <laughs> yes. So. So we're, I'm looking at the time and I want to be respectful to everyone's time as as we still probably all have things to do before we start work the next day. Um, the one last thing I want to ask and, and some of these questions have been great. I'm just going to round up and that is someone asked, what can we do to help our immune systems even now as we're kind of, you know, getting um, trying to get back into to being exposed to each other and everything is there. One last piece of advice about staying healthy outside of getting your vaccine and outside of all those things. Wash your hands, Nick says. Anything else? Go, Nick. <laughs> Cover your cough like Dracula. Um, well, as far as as far as are you talking about us keeping ourselves in? in yeah, immunity? yeah. Like you know, as they someone made the comment, as you get older, your immunity does go down. What are some things we can do to make ourselves feel better? I have some things to say, but I bet Nick is better at this. Well, I, what I did was retire. <laughs> when I was working, I was exposed to teachers and parents and snotty kids. And I was I got sick three, four times a year. And since I've retired, if I get one cold a year, it's a lot. So retire. <laughs> the other the other things that are actually practical for people who not not like Nick and me who are retired <laughs> and can choose and pick and choose what we do and where we go. For those of you who are working and, and can't be and around other people or, or just you're around other people. The th things you can do to improve your immune system obviously are good sleep, a good balanced diet, um, exercise. And, and I know these things are things, oh, sure, I've heard yeah. that many times, but they these things will help you maintain a viable uh, immune system. If you're not getting a good night's sleep and you're not eating well, and you're sitting in the couch all day eating potato chips and watching television, your immune system will not be as strong. So, so people, people talk about immune boosters, that vitamin C, D3, zinc. Yeah, those are fine. They're not dangerous. Whatever you want to do with the uh, supplements or vitamins is fine as long as they're not dangerous. They may help. Who knows? Minimize, minimize stress, which is yeah, always, always stress. hard to do. But if you can minimize stress, that's helpful as well. They Send your kids off to school and <laughs> retire. <laughs> I, did, I, I noticed in the chat, Heather, there were a couple, I was trying to chat, mm -hmm. look at a couple of things, questions about um, like waivers for getting back together. Like what one, one of the things to do when coral groups get back together again, should, should there be a, like a waiver and people should sign a waiver so that the, the, the organization's not held, you know, legally responsible. I, I don't know the legal answer to, to that question, but I know that the, the Barbershop Harmony Society uh, um, uh, update that, that came out about all of this has a section on legalities of, of this. And I don't know if they make specific recommendations, but I know they talk about the whole concept of, of legal you know, liability for choral groups who are getting back together again and singing in this environment. So that, that may, you know, people can look at that. I'll send that to you when you send that out, they might wanna take a look at that. Great, so um, I would like to thank both Dr. Minotti and Dr. Allen for uh, taking their time today. We will collect, this has been recorded, so we will get it out on a link. Um, we'll also connect, uh, um, I've been taking all of the links that you've been sharing um, and we'll put them out. The Georgia Tech link came through, the Barbershop Society, all of those things will come out. I'll put them all out together and send out at that out as well. Um, please kind of keep you know, talking about this, I know it's a scary new world in a way for us to know when we're supposed to do this. Um, and so I think talking and researching and, and finding good resources and trusted resources is, is gonna be our key as we walk this path all together. Um, every choir is different. Some are big, some are small, some are older, some are younger. Um, so there's not definitely a one, one fits all answer. And so please continue to, to do our research and, and discuss and, um, 
ask experts as we did today um, to try to, to figure out what the, the, new, the new world will be as we come back together. So um, thank you again to Ira and Nick. Um, and uh, there will be, um, I should be sending out the email within this, within this week with everything put together. So, all right. Oh, thanks for having me, Heather. It was fine. Thank you. Thank Heather, you. Nice to share this with you, Ira. Yeah, thanks, Nikos. I liked your presentation. Um, <laughs> Heather, I have some additional things I'll send you as well, sure. just maybe an informational item or two. Um, but if there's questions, I'm sure there's a ton of questions on the chat that didn't get answered. Right. There's a few that are that I've kept. I I have them written down so we I, can. I, I tell this when I do classroom presentations. I tell the teacher, look, if there's some questions I didn't we didn't answer, if you want to send them along in like an email or something, and, sure. and I can write some answers out and send it back, and you can distribute it if you want. That'd um, be perfect. Yeah, because I, I hate it when I'm in a meeting and I, I can't get my I question. Know. Answered. Like, darn, I wanted my question answered. <laughs> I know I hate being the moderator and being like okay we're done so um but but I will I will I'll get as many of these kind of written to you and and we can kind of have a little thing and then I'll put that out as well with the with the group as well the the group email so and just preface that, that that there's there's probably some questions in there that may be beyond Nick and my ability to absolutely. Not, not absolutely experts, not experts in that area but um Whatever we can answer, we certainly, I, 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 I'm sure we will do our best to answer. Right. Get to the group. David, and, thanks for your, your technical help, David. And GSCC is also going to be starting a podcast channel. So it may be that uh, we can convince these fine gentlemen to come do a podcast at some point in time. And um, maybe we can answer some of the questions that need more research there at some point in time in the future. Mm -hmm. I'm always I'm willing to help. I always want to preface it with that. I, yeah, I'm not like the uh, Department of Health state epidemiologist or a, a vaccinologist who's worked in the field for 30 years. OK, so it's again, it's information I'm gathering, factual scientific information I'm gathering that I can then distribute and maybe help explain to people who don't have access or, or aren't sure what to believe and aren't sure what's science and what's not. Because here's the biggest thing. Science is not an opinion. <laughs> The other one, the other one I like is, is uh, science doesn't care whether you believe it or not. It just is. Thanks, Heather. All right. Thank you all. Have a great, have a great week. I'll send out the information as soon as we get it. Thank you. Peter, thanks for attending you and Anne. <laughs>